Start us off, Carter. Welcome back to the Night Shift Podcast, your go-to podcast for all things Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, I know we've been diving in to the latest book drop recently, but we simply have to pivot. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the Five Nights at Freddy's movie is finally coming out this week. And we are covering everything about it. What animatronics will make surprise appearances that haven't already been announced? Will my personal favorite lefty get his time in the sun? How many YouTubers will show up in this movie? And will the bite of 87 be depicted? Or the bite of 83, depending on who you ask. But actually, this is Carter and Kevin Explain Football. Carter here. I'm Kevin, and wondering if we will... Are we going to have a group watch along for that? Oh, God. I mean, I am... Look, I'm normally an advocate for, like, if you feel comfortable and you have means to safely go to a movie theater, like, health-wise... I was going to say it's on Peacock, and I have Peacock. Yes. Uh, Normally, I say go see movies in theaters, don't see them on streaming, but there is not a chance in hell I am going to a movie theater for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, the answer is yes. If anything else... Correct a mundo. So, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> week six is in the book. I mean, it'll it'll probably destroy our friendship, but boy, howdy, will, will it be a great drop to the roller coaster, baby? Um, so, week six is finally in the books. Possibly the most profoundly dumb week of football we've had in quite a long time. Ooh, Maybe was... that's not the right word for it, but it was utter chaos. I think, like, I think personally we can agree week four was like the week of a lot of blowouts week yeah. five was the week of just solid football all around minus Not the a, saints game very few boring yeah very uh-huh. few boring games yeah and then there was week six and just a bucket of nonsense right Like, you know it was going to be a rare one when we start off with chiefs broncos and you're like come on chiefs now is the time uh, and they only win 19-8. Yeah, that's not even enough of a point spread to, like, bench people. Right? Like, for goodness sake. Um, yes, so this was a week where our last two undefeated teams went down. Some upsets almost happened. Some upsets did happen. And uh, just about everything in between uh, occurred. And the Jaguars still lost by 20 points. Or the Panthers still lost by 20 yeah, points. Yeah, I was going to say the Jaguars won, sir. We Too many cat teams. We don't need a team in Carolina and Jacksonville. Pick one. Cincinnati. <laughs> but no, no. They can, they're up north. They're fine. They cover ground. No, wait. Why do we have two teams in Cleveland? You know what? No, we Not can't. We can't get this team in general. Right. Why do I always call Ohio Cleveland? That's not even a Carter's being goofy thing. That's just a thing I do. Um, anyway, uh, shall we kick it off with our first highlight of the week? Sure, absolutely. Um, let me get to the right page, um, the tabs. Um, Jaguars and Ch- uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Speaking of the cat teams, uh, look at that segue. Go us. Uh, they seem to be back in the swing of things. So Yes. Both teams um, had – Jaguars had a very clear win. However, one could argue it's it was against Minshew Madness himself. Um, mm-hmm. But Jaguars won 37-20. to 20. Trevor Lawrence, 20 for 30, 180 yards, two TDs, and only one touchdown this time. Or one interception, right. I apologize. Despite their problems being different, both of these teams have been sort of similar, like, hey – uh, you guys have kind of great expectations for a change now. Like, what is happening here? Uh, for the Bengals, it was easy to understand. Uh, Joe Burrow had a severe calf injury, and he could not move right, and that yes. kind of well, through the course of every single thing they did. Whereas the Jaguars, it was weirdly more of an abstract problem. Like, it just felt like they could never figure out the rhythm they wanted on offense. They could never figure out the flow they wanted to do. They also um, don't have a terrible record. They're four and two. <laughs> Right? That's the weird thing. They feel like a much worse team. Like, you... it's kind of the... It's the same thing I'd say about the Ravens, where I'm like, how is your record not... Well, for the Jaguars, it's how is your record not worse. The Ravens, it's how is your record not, not better. better. Yeah. Like, it's it's one of those things where it's like, we're, we're into the season enough that things aren't, like, 
there's been clear a significant amount of games played. Like I would say, <laughs> six is a significant amount of games. I agree. And you have like you have a four and two, so you're winning over like you're winning double what you're losing at the moment. That's really good, but I feel like, and I'm definitely, definitely one of the aspects of it, but like, like kind of giving the Jaguar shit about it, like a little extra, uh-huh. like, it's like, oh, the Jaguars are terrible. They're such a bad team. They're four and two. They're, and yeah, it's, like, it's... it's not their year this year. It's like, they're still clearly winning their they're an yeah, it's game just weird ahead for their division. It's it is just a feeling of like we wanted you to be even better. We wanted you to be battling for maybe even the bye week for the playoffs, and it's just weird. Like they're not out of it yet, though. That's the thing. Yeah, and that's why it feels weird. It's all vibes, and a part of it is like half of their wins have come overseas. Yeah, um, that's also and I also true. think a part of it is like I don't know. Do Doug Peterson teams only succeed when they're the underdogs? Like, if they have expectations, are they just fundamentally worse? Honestly, I feel like that might be that might be the thing to prove this season. If they if they keep an underdog style mm. and go far, it might be Doug Peterson's an underdog coach. When you have like Andy Reid, who's uh, like Andy Reid and Bill Belichick, who are like stacked team coaches. And like, cause like, example, I look at Bell and check without a stacked team. Right. And yeah, I like, I do think there is something to be said about like, I don't know, for being a front runner versus, you know, being surprising. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you just have to behave yourself differently when you have a certain level of expectation every single year. Yeah. But also, um, kind of giving them their credit, uh, Cincinnati. Oh, not yes. A, not um, a huge win winning by a little bit more than a field goal and that was a very meat and potatoes kind of game yeah. like i don't think either team necessarily played bad yeah. i think it was just a kind of a slugfest honestly you know what's interesting the seahawks mm-hmm. had better star stats in total yards passing yards rushing yards and yards per play seahawks did better in every single one of those categories but they yeah, still, really? still lost yeah I think I think it was because it was just like a real grinder football game. The Bengals quietly have one of the best. Well, not so quietly anymore, but um, their their defensive coaching staff is incredible. Uh, their def- if your defensive coordinator has a nickname, uh, which in this case it's Big Lou, uh, you know you're in you for some he's... chicanery. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they are like the embodiment of like how and not just. Like, you know, there are regular season play uh regular season defenses that are like, we just have better, you know, we just have men, we just have like, you know, depth. And San you know, Francisco, we're just going mano a mano with you. Hey man, I didn't say it, you did. Uh, um, no, I'm fully aware whereas, of their defenses. Whereas like the Bengals don't have the names, but they just come up with like these artisanal plans for every major week. They just cook up some new scheme that, you know, you couldn't be prepared for, that you couldn't see, and just, like, handle every situation better than the last. I did see you also put this on as your don't sleep on game, and I would agree with that. I think that's a good pick. Yeah, so I'll go into it a little bit more later. But, um, yeah, next on the docket is the Jets win, I guess. Uh, Why are we doing this? That's it. Why are we here? Just suffer? I know you're going to get your Eagles rant I'm on. I'm going to get it in a in a minute. However, I'd like to. Yeah, my wife is cheering over there because she's a Jets fan. Um, I forget that. Thank but, God you haven't learned how to spell divorce yet. Yeah, it's really beneficial to this. <laughs> um, um, but I've, really I've always said, dumb, dumb game. Regard like, regardless of how much I like the Eagles and how much I don't like other teams. I got to give credit where credit is due. And while the Jets while the Jets won against the Eagles, I can't deny they had some pretty good plays. I just I just really fucking hate watching like for me they're just not an entertaining 
uh, like they're just not an entertaining team to watch. I'd be like, more I don't excited find the way they about it defense. if it wasn't the Zach Wilson Jets. I mean, I would ha- not be more excited, but I would give it more oomph if it wasn't the Zach Wilson Jets. Um, yeah, it's and like, see, that's why I get like the wish casting for them to trade for someone because it is like. Uh, like I fundamentally get like, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have an exciting quote unquote New York City team that has like a cool offense, and they don't get to have that because they drafted Zach Wilson. Um, mm-hmm. But like, man, I like I, and like I would, I guess I was lucky that like I had a lot of stuff to do before the Sunday night game, so like my four to six o'clock spot was like me out and about because like watching even the highlights, I'm like, God, this is just exhausting. It's like I'm tired looking at this. Yeah, it was. I was. It was a game. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Fair enough. Um, next up, huge win for the Cleveland Browns. Um, look, I, I I've said before I don't like giving Cleveland their gas, but their defense is on a historic pace. They've only let up, I believe, a little over a thousand yards this season. Um, for reference, and I pulled up this stat earlier, and I meant to keep it up. So they've literally only allowed like a thousand yards of total offense for the entire year. Um, do you know how many quarterbacks already have over a thousand yards this year, just on their own? Six. Uh, twenty-eight. Oh. You know. That includes Zach Wilson, Kenny Pickett, Jimmy Garoppolo, Matt Jones, Justin Fields, um, uh, Russell Wilson. Some real stinkers. Desmond Ritter has over 1,000 yards. Yikes. And Cleveland has been able to keep everyone to that. And you know what's funny? Like, I've been the guy who's like, I can't stand Brock Purdy. I'm tired of the cult of Purdy. And, like, I don't know. Like, a lot of people like me are taking their victory laps. Like, haha, see, if you take away the talent and have him against a good defense, he isn't good. And I'm like... I don't know, man. This feels like we do this every week where we overreact to, like, the quote-unquote best team in the league losing. But also, like, yeah, this might just be a historic, unprecedented um, defense that they went up against, and he lost his best player. So, like, I don't know if we can take anything of it from this game other than, yes, the Cleveland defense is very, very good. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good defense. And also, get ready for this stat. They, they scored 19 points. Uh, they won 19 to 17. Um, second quarter is when they went from 10, uh, it was 10 to, and then they scored. So 10 for San Francisco, they scored their first touchdown. And then field goal, field goal, field goal, field goal. That's four field goals for their scoring. <laughs> That's awesome, in my opinion. Well, yeah, like they I was shocked how much they were letting PJ Walker actually try to throw the ball. He's an XFL like, led, quarterback too. <laughs> yes, a former XFL quarterback. Cause I'm like, I need like I'm having a team meeting before that game starts and be like, just so we're all on the same page, unless we get the ball in on our side of the field, we are not pushing it. We are running the ball three times. Maybe sometimes we'll do a screen pass on the third play. We are literally going to just, this is going to be a disgusting, ugly football game where they are just going to run out of time to score points. Yeah. And when they did that, they succeeded. Yeah. Um, but yes, of course, all of my, like, gussying up Christian McCaffrey and he injures his oblique. Like clock, like freaking clockwork, man. Okay. Like, I keep, that was like my big betting ticket this season and now it's up in the air. All right, the Lions are good. The good Falcons. <laughs> Would you yes. care to so, elaborate on your opinion? This specific... <laughs> I'm not this disagreeing, specific... but I'm just so this specific take started because, like, on my morning run, I was listening to a podcast where they were complaining about um, uh, Gibbs not getting the ball enough, and then they just started kind of complaining about in general, like, why did the Lions use their first? their two first round picks on a running back and a linebacker, like non priority positions. 
like, and it was all this, I realized it's like, it's all the same discussion we were having about the Atlanta Falcons of like, why are they drafting Bijan Robinson when they already have good running backs? Yeah. Why are they doing this? Why aren't they getting a quarterback? And it's like, it really is striking how both of them have the exact same criticisms in terms of like playing they, a certain type of football that personally vexes people. They did a but, similar thing, but the Lions succeeded at it. Yes, he, but the Lions are good at it. And you want to know why they're good at it? Because they, well, one, they have a really great offensive coordinator, but also they have like a good, it really is the difference of having a good quarterback. Like, you know what? Like Jared Goff, he's kind of gotten thrown through the mud a little bit. Like, in terms of the ick factor, that Super Bowl he lost against the Patriots was an all-time, like, oh, we just permanently have the ick on you. Yeah. Because the Patriots players after the game were like, yeah, we we decided to change it up. We were going to do things that made him shit his pants. And he did. He did a lot. Um, and then he lost to the Jets, who were trying to tank for Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. Um, but, like, no. Here's, like, the critical difference between him and Desmond Ritter is he actually gets everybody the ball. He has, you know, he has good talent that gets the ball. Um, you know, like, it, it's so funny how so similar they are in terms of, like, approaching the design of a football team in this very kind of, like, meathead, like, old-school way. Like, well, simultaneously old-school and new-school because it's, yeah. like, part of it's, like, positionless football. A part of it is, like, yeah, we're going to be grinder. We're getting these, you know, we're building on the lines. We're building in the trenches. We're building in the linebacking core, the running back core. But they got the quarterback, so it works. Yeah, it feels it feels like they were I think the best way to describe it is it feels like they built wrongly according to your keyboard coaches. And Yes. Can't deny if you watch the pattern they built their team very weird. It also doesn't help with, you know, cheat not cheating scandals, uh, gambling scandals and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like, Jameson Williams was the most out-of-character pick for them, trading up for, like, a like a speedster wide receiver. Yeah. And he's barely played. Yeah, and it's such, like... It's so weird how they built this team, but it works. Yeah, like, like, I genuinely can't believe that, like, oh, are we really going to have, like, the, are we really going to have the Detroit Lions as a division winner? And based off of their showing, uh, playing the Buccaneers, which I believe was right off the Buccaneers' bye week, uh, it's scary. That was a... Oh, yeah. Like, the Buccaneers had just as much momentum going in, and they got kind of, like... You know, they kind of got the business handed to them. I, in a lot of ways, I'm like, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm just like, yeah, this is where we can sort of tone down the hype for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a little bit. Like, you know, this is what I've been saying about Baker Mayfield kind of having a ceiling that isn't the best. But yeah, no, the Lions are now emphatically in the driver's seat for uh, the division, if yeah. not the NFC. No, they, like... Once again, the perspective of things of, like, you don't think about at the time and stuff because it changed for each team. Lions are having a fire season. They're 5-1. and one. You know who else is 5-1? and one? San Francisco 49ers and the Philadelphia Eagles, people that they were like, these are the top two teams of the division. The Lions caught up with them. Oh, yeah. That's like, insane. I'm almost like... You know, we were saying, like, going into the season, the top tier was, it was San Fran, Philly, Cowboys. And I'm like, are we sure the Lions aren't better than the Cowboys? Are we positive? On a on a technical listing, yes, they are right now. Cowboys are 4-2, and two, Lions are 5-1. and one. Lions are better than the Cowboys. I mean, fuck, I'd even consider the Rams over the Cowboys. Well, no, let's not get crazy. <laughs> But it's just kind of. I mean, I like watching the Rams more. That's for sure. Yeah, it's just what an what an odd time because I feel like they pulled they pulled one of the biggest switches a couple years ago when they did the trade Stafford for Goff, correct? Or did I yeah. make that up? And yeah, no, that was like a paradigm shifter, and yet now both teams feel like they won from that. It's so weird because they kind of both did 
Yeah, the you know the line or the Rams got exactly what they wanted. Um, like they got exactly what they wanted from that a yeah. Super Bowl, and Jared Goff got to basically rebuild his career in a much lower stakes environment, and now is, I mean, he. I'm trying to think. How it's many like, quarterbacks would I have in front of him? Mahomes, Allen, Lamar. Uh, I would say. Burrow, Gino. I would say Goff is maybe top 50% of the league. I mean, yeah, I'm like, At, you know, how many would I actually put ahead of him? I'm not yeah. 100% sure. It's 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 less than I thought. Yeah. But it's like I think the the difference between like first going to the Lions Goff versus now Goff is very astronomically different. Oh, yeah. In a lot of ways, it's it's weirdly what we talk about with, like, you know, famous Philly athletes, Carson Wentz and Ben Simmons. Like, <laughs> yeah. the talk with Ben Simmons was like, no, he needs to go to, like, Orlando or Oklahoma City, where it's like there's zero expectations, zero, like, ESPN coverage, and he can just figure out how to play the sport again and, like, figure out if he actually wants to play the sport again. It's, it's and the retirement it actually, team. That's what it is. It's... Yeah, it's effectively, uh, like, semi-retirement. And it actually worked for Jared Goff. Yeah. Like, again, he looks good, and this team has, like, swagger. Like, they're running, like, they run fun plays. They have this, like, rumbling, bumbling maniac as their tight end now who has, <laughs> like, really baby gronk energy. <laughs> like, yeah. again, you can't say they don't know what kind of team they want to build and exactly build that. Yeah. Like, again, there's a reason why we were saying Jameson Williams feels so out of place with everything else. Yeah, no, it's so, like, we've talked about it a couple times with various teams throughout the league, um, where it's like, ah, oh, you want to build around, you obviously want to build your offense around a quarterback, and I feel like they didn't quite do that. Mm -hmm. I feel like they built the team, started building the team, or put in motion to build the team, and then they're like, oh, shoot, we need a quarterback, and then that's just happens to be when the Rams called them for a trade and be like, Hey, you guys want to do this? And they're just like, sure, let's see what happens. I mean, one of the interesting discussions is like, how many more years can you get out of Jared Goff? Like you drafted Hayden Hooker as like a theoretical replacement at some point, but like, you know, Hayden Hooker is already like 25. Yeah. Like maybe you just look for someone who wants like a, a like, midterm developmental quarterback and just get more draft capital yeah i think i think with how some of these quarterback pictures are going this year that could be a very smart and easy move for them to make because can't deny there's very clear underperformers this year um mm. and you think you can, it's like things could go in their favor if they maybe not offer but like themselves but be open for the negotiations and hearing out offers for him because right Goff's it's like kind of like how i said it a little bit where it's like that you go to a retirement team where you play a season or two for them and you're not gonna win but you're not gonna be getting shit on every week and oh yeah you can your contract runs up and you quietly stop playing because it's like oh i'm not against stopping playing but nobody wants you anymore you've clearly over like your welcome's clearly ending unless if somebody blows it i'm looking at you carson wentz and <laughs> i actually can't believe he's not on a team yet like yeah. i can't believe i'm not surprised. i mean <sighs> Yeah, I guess you're right, I am, and I'm not. Like, he at the same time, it's like so many bad quarterbacks get to play. So many teams get so desperate. He couldn't make like, it as think, a quarterback just... on the, the Washington. Like On the Washington. The Washington. I feel like that's kind of a clear indicator, especially how wa with how Washington was doing at the time. You know what? Fair. Because um, the hiring staff... They're not stupid. They can tell the difference between a quarterback doing bad and just a good quarterback being stuck on a bad team. And, I mean, honestly, that might have been, might have been what happened with Trevor Lawrence. They realized he was a 
good quarterback stuck on a bad team because they changed the coaching staff and look at him now. Exactly. But they're fully aware of all that kind of stuff. So if if you ran your course, and especially if you're changing teams a lot over the course of a short amount of time, like he went to Indy, he went to Washington, and it's just like, you know what, maybe maybe we're just going to quietly not acknowledge you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Shall you elaborate on your sleeper game of the week? Yep, sleeper of the game of the week. I'm on the wrong week again. I keep scrolling up and down because we keep every week on one Google Doc. Oh, well. Um, I said Seattle versus Cincinnati. I touched on it a little bit earlier, but it was a real grinder game. And it's – I'm not saying it's like – well, Joe Burrow can arguably be – made for quarterback elite last season this season he hasn't quite shown it yet right but it was it was feet in the trenches football they're shoot they're shooting hoops they're scoring home runs um but they're all they're all playing with like their head down they're not focusing on things going on around them it's just football and for a game to get your kind of start showing you have your mojo back i think versus the seahawks is like a very good choice because they're not the more recent seahawks i would never count them out of it they're good but gettable yeah and it's like i feel like that's like a solid like b b plus tier of like these like of recent years these guys are definitely wild card contenders past that who knows before that it's like all right if they had a rough season then yeah but mm-hmm. i feel like they had a great showing for what they what they each could do cuz it was also in all the stats were in the Seahawks favor too so i feel like it was a gr- like the team that didn't have the stats in their favor winning. Kind of a good stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk about yours a little bit, I guess. All right. Judging uh, you. What? Why are you judging me for this? Because I have a very disagreeing opinion, actually. Yeah, this one is absolutely a schadenfreude one. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, yeah, I just... Truly two of the most inept coaching uh, games I've ever seen. So I wanted to talk about the Cowboys a little bit. So last season, they got obsessed with that idea that Dak Prescott was throwing too many interceptions. Um, Like last year, he threw, pulling up the stat now. um, Last season, he threw, and I don't, it really wasn't even that many. But like, you know, with, um, he threw 15 interceptions which is a lot. I think it ended up leading the league, but it really wasn't as bad as that sounds. And like the offense got the job done, but instead they get rid of the offensive coordinator and Mike McCarthy takes over the offense, the embodiment of Catwater offense. Their offense is now miserably predictable. It is literally run up the middle, run up the middle, uh, throw in an obvious uh, third down situation and then punt because the obvious third down situation didn't work. And he's still throwing interceptions. You didn't even solve the problem that probably would have solved itself. And like in the modern NFL, I'm just not like overly concerned. As long as you're producing enough points to win, like I'm not overly concerned about higher interception numbers. Like you want to know a stat I pulled up? Drew Brees, he's had, he had years where he had 16, 15, 15, 18, 17, 22, 19, 17, 15 interceptions. And those were like peak Pro Bowl years. He wasn't yeah. wa- those weren't his like wash years. Like when you're throwing the ball as much as you do in certain offenses, you're just gonna it have happens. interceptions. Yeah, it happens. Right. And if you and have so, a good team, you're gonna give given a harder schedule. Right. And like you basically nuked your entire offense. Like you got rid of arguably the guy you probably like let um control the team um 
for the sake of like Kellen Moore was the offensive coordinator you fired who went to the Chargers. He probably should have been the head coach and you like got rid of him. And now you just have this boring offense. You're just lucky that Staley on the other side is just horrifically inept. I don't understand how a defensive coach of this like pedigree or the status can't run a functional defense. And then on top of that, the Chargers offense is just inexplicably a stick in the mud despite having Justin Herbert, like a guy who can throw the ball 70 yards. Yeah. Like, like it was bleak. I don't know why they can't run the ball. I don't know why they can't get the ball downfield. Like, I think the like we're talking Jalen Rager stuff with Quentin Johnson already because despite Mike Williams going down with an ACL tear, like he had two targets, zero yards, and he had the backbreaking interception at the end of the game where he just got bodied by the cornerback. Yeah, like truly, both these teams are just the epitome of like you have the exact wrong coach right now, but you've convinced yourself to give it one more year, and all that's achieved is you're wasting another year. Yeah. I felt like I felt like they were just kind of running around like a bunch of it was a lot of like not like I don't want to say like I don't know the best way to describe it it felt weird watching it because it was just like it was clearly neither team's best and it was you can tell it was like play calling and coaching level decisions uh -huh. but it was just like huh like what is happening like I've I literally wondered that multiple times while I was watching the game. I was like, why am I watching this? What is happening here? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like a oh, this plays insane like I how like I don't know what they're doing like when the Chiefs did that ring around the rosy play last year and you're just like, "Oh my god, what are they doing? What's happening?" It was like why why is it taking more than one person to screw in the light bulb of this game? What what are we doing? Exactly. Um, I'd also yeah. one hundred percent like to give an honorable mention to Forty ers Browns because winning by with using four field goals, also relying on a field goal miss for the like in the last seconds of the game to win the game. That's pretty insane. I wanna I wanna stress to the audience that this it is a bit, but it isn't a bit. He is this serious about field goals. I love the field art goals. of field goals. Field yeah, goals. no, this is like it, he's always been like this. Oh yeah, field goals and linemen. That's where like Kieran's got his fullback thing and running back thing where you got to run the ball. I'm all about <laughs> I'm all about field goals and linemen. The smallest and the biggest people on the team. And I've always been into f basketball equally as much and trying to use basketball metaphors to explain football things to people and realizing that largely falls on deaf ears in this circle. It does. I don't pay attention to basketball at all. Um, all right. The low lights. Shall you get your uh, Eagles ring out of the way? Hold on, Let's hold get on. it out of your system, buddy. Trust me, you'll feel better after. See, I also, it's been a minute since the game, so I've cooled down my rage a decent bit, um, hmm. which is good because now it's going to be more uh, intelligent conversation as opposed to me just rambling like a lunatic right right but um my direct reactions after that game were i believe this is a load of donkey piss who put this yeah the language in our field? chat got very ugly yeah it got real ugly in the chat got, people yeah i had it was an ugly chat like with words and i try to have i mean i try to feel creative and venting how i felt um, but it was a shit show. It was a hot mess. There's, there was clearly things that went wrong. And first off, three interceptions by Jalen Hurts. What the shit, man? Um, Weren't they all in the second half too? Like it was very weirdly similar to what happened to the Bills, where they had the lead going into the half and then just kind of exploded. Yeah, they had the lead, uh, fourteen to nine going into the second half. And then they just didn't decide to score again. Um, it was, there was poor stats all around. Jalen Hurts had the best rushing of the game. A.J. Brown had only seven receptions 
and no TDs and was the best receiver. It was it was a hot mess on ice. The de- the defense was the defense was actually pretty good. They they weren't amazing. They held their own. However, it was clear where there were replacements cuz a couple of big names especially for this season were sitting out. Um you had Jalen Carter huge rookie uh-huh. of the year candidate um it's like he he was out you had Darius Slay who's out one of the better corners in the league and like that's that's kind of a kick in the butt with Slay being out because Eagles the Eagles secondary does not have a lot of good depth and then you had like Blankenship getting pulled out um, because he hurt his ribs, and he's a fiend back there, too. So it's like that one sucked. And then Big Lane Johnson on the offensive line got – he fudged his ankle up a little bit, but it's looking good, very fortunately. And <laughs> they replaced him with Jack Driscoll. Ah, uh, man. I hate that guy. <laughs> he – yeah, he did not do good. He did not do average. He did bad. Like the Eagles are known for having a very solid offensive line across the board. Yeah, for a team as famous as the Eagles are for having an offensive line, the fact that I didn't hear about this guy until this week where every single radio caller was talking about him, I'm like that can't be good. Like he he's one of those guys he played like He's had, like, special teams plays. They're pulling lane because the win is so clear that we're putting in all of our backups and resting up our starters. That's when we're going to put them in. And it doesn't matter how good you're going to do because your goal is to waste time. And right, that he, he was a, almost a revolving door for their defense. Like... Jalen Hurts is a man on the mis- on a mission when he plays. And you can see it very clearly sometimes. He literally held somebody. He held a defender away from him as he threw the ball for a hot like couple of seconds, which was just oh, pure yeah. strength and super cool. Yeah, like it's weird that I don't blame Hurts for that game as much as I probably should considering. Well, one of the interceptions he... was obviously a fumble. I don't yes. know why they keep calling it an interception. He did not have a good game. It's, I feel like though, you can like you can't really blame him for the loss, but you can't, you can't be like it's not Jalen's fault. He's definitely at fault too. Devontae mm-hmm. Smith with some huge drops is at fault. AJ Brown where he just stopped running in the middle of a play, also can be blamed. Dallas Goddard, oof, that was a rough game for him. And yeah, Goddard is weirdly, like, for all the, like, the vibes are off with the team, the vibes are off with the team, the only one who I really feel like the vibes are off for is Dallas Goddard, who's just yeah. not getting any play in this offense right now. He he did great last week, and this week he just was just fumbling like a fool. Good thing I have him on my fantasy team. Uh, real excited about that. Again, just draft check this Kelsey first and never I think about had it no chance. for the rest of the year. <laughs> you um, had the first pick. You yeah. could have picked anyone you wanted, and you picked a kicker. <laughs> I did do that. <laughs> you fucking maniac. Yeah, I did do that. That was 100% me, which is hilarious. Um, and you were threatening it for weeks. Yeah, I wasn't threatening it. I was declaring it. I made my intentions very well known. Anyway, there was a lot of blunders on this. And I'm kind of glad it happened now because we'll talk about it a little bit more later. One of their Kelly Green games is up next week. And if you I, lost in the – had a game like this with the Kelly Greens, you'd look like real jackasses. You'd look real stupid, and I feel like – I feel like this is a little bit – I'm, ho- I'm I know it wasn't a throwaway game, but in my – head cannon to make myself feel better about it 
they played super precautiously with taking people out, especially like Darius Slay sitting out, Lane Johnson. So they can get an opportunity to get some reps in during the Kelly Green game. And because these guys are kind of Eagle staples at this point. Uh-huh. Like, and the Kelly Green game is very interesting. Like, it's a, it's a dynamic, like, almost homecoming thing for Eagles fans. And when you're, like, long standing, like, cinder blocks for the team and you haven't gotten to play them one yet and now is your opportunity to i feel like that's i feel like that secretly takes priority um yeah i just you know that's i'd like to think this is a that's what i tell myself to feel this was going to be a game Yeah. yeah no i mean there's some truth to that it's like again the jets have been uh a clown show this entire year the only games they've won feel like they're by accident um even the game against the broncos and it was another game that it feels like they won by accident i think that's why it annoys me because well one i just don't want to deal with the jets anymore but also robert sala being so like peacocking about it where it's like dude your defense is one bad zach wilson game away from like making you walk the plank like seriously your career is holding on by a thread here my guy as for the eagles i just it is weird because you watch them and you're like, they're moving the ball. They look fine. I don't know what's wrong. See, I think a part of it is this... Hertz is set to have tw- 200 more throws than he did last year. I just like... Which is insane. We... The amount of throws, by the way. Yeah, it's like, I love Jalen Hurts, but like he's not a 400 to 500 attempt a year guy. He is like... He's like... I don't know how to describe it, but he's like a facilitator of offense and a chunk of the offense involves like running him being the focal point of a lethal running game. Yeah. And it, like, I get it. You gave him a lot of money and it's hard to justify ha- letting him have that many carries, but it's like, if you are not like, if he is not b- effectively running a sort of option system where like any play could be any kind of play for lack of yeah. a better word, then I just don't think you're using him right. No, Jay- like, I think you're trying to, I think you're trying to make a different kind of offense that he doesn't belong in. Jalen Hurts is clearly one of those quarterbacks that is a field general. He's a good leader on and off the field, and he can, like, he is a big threat in a bunch of regards, kind of like Lamar Jackson, kind of like how Tom Brady was. And it's just like he can, and Josh Allen, too, where he's like, he can throw. He can get a solid run in. Who knows what's going to happen? Like, if you're talking like Kirk Cousins or Matt Stafford, I'd put money on this guy throw. Like, if he, uh-huh. he doesn't hand the ball off in 0.2 seconds, he's going to throw it. Almost guaranteed, unless if they make the hugest gap for them. And I feel like that's where, like, and that's something that separates, like, top tier quarterbacks from average quarterbacks is that threat of being able to do whatever they at whatever point and it was just stupid calls especially the last quarter you have the ball you have the lead throwing hasn't been working all day play more conservative than the republican party just it really is like it's the same thing the bills did it's so weird how similar a game this was someone needs to get on the mic and be like the only way we are get- losing this game is if they beat if we beat ourselves and that's like, kind of what Zach happened. wilson is not capable of beating us right now i will say but if you he let him a, he had a he pretty will. decent game he didn't do terrible himself but i would i would describe these last couple weeks of zach wilson one time we went to hershey park and we had to leave the dog home and we come home and he's pooped a lot and we're like ah ah but then someone goes no no see he pooped in a pile isn't that good and i'm like why are we applauding this that's not like that's that's the equivalent celebrating the bare minimum of incompetence yeah but it was like it's literally like they had the ball the majority of the second half they have it Like, they're holding it as they're running down the field, and throwing's clearly not working. You're still in the lead. Just run the ball. 
try like pull like try and get as many yards as possible pull something like with like short screens and stuff like that pull out like some ballsy maybe a ballsy play per set of downs to get that first down and do not run outside of the lines stay in the game catch the ball run slide whatever just to waste the clock if they waste if they just chose to waste the clock they would have won but they went for risky plays at like at the point of the game where it's like we can't come if we blow it now we can't we might not get another possession and that's right that's what happens it is um it's it's something i've said before it's like if you're going against an inferior team that's putting up a good fight you're not playing against yourself you're playing against the clock it's about getting out of there as yeah. quickly as humanly possible like i i like i understand when people are like oh the team's terrible like they did a poor like that wasn't a good win like all season long the eagles fans have been saying it's like that wasn't a good one that wasn't clean we should have done better a win is Who still cares? a win you the second that game clock ends the stat that matters is your if you won or lost or i guess technically tied but that's a little <laughs> hard to get to nowadays um but it's like yeah it's yeah exactly it's don't get injured um yeah it's yeah if as long as you're not losing bodies a win is a win like yeah. obviously for me it feels different for the bills because it's like you know we're hemorrhaging players but like you know if lane can come back in a reasonable time just get the win and pat yourself on he's the back. he's probably going to be playing on sunday which is oh, good and bad um yeah i think i think if it wasn't such a high profile game i would be like sit his ass out but i feel like since it is a high profile game I think it's more of he doesn't want to sit out, which I can kind of respect. Um, anyway, what else? Uh, Crimney Cracker Jacks. Uh, wow, that's clearly a Carter note. Desmond Ritter. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so funny. Again, we rewarded the bear man that the dog didn't poop all over the house. He just pooped in a pile. Um, and uh, this week, holy shit, uh, Desmond Ritter. Uh, truly one of the most iconically bad collapses in, like, honestly, in my recent memory. Because here's the thing. The score going into the fourth quarter was 24 to 10. Uh, you know, Washington looked competent. Sam Howell, again, uh, what makes him in the, like, Ryan Fitzpatrick camp, where it's like, I have that dog in me. I can be the best player on the field. The only difference is he's also getting, like, you know, pancaked. Like, yes. again, his limbs are going to fly off like a Lego man. Oh, absolutely. Um, like, the rate Star, Lego Star Wars. Um, but anyway, like, they did not score the entire fourth quarter. They they were begging Atlanta to come back in this game. Uh, to recap the drives to end the game, it was... It was... Uh, hold on. Uh, end of the second quarter, end of the third. It, for the... Um, for the Commanders, it was uh, punt, 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 end of game. Uh, <laughs> instead of doing anything with that, it was they scored an early touchdown at the start of the fourth quarter. Then it was interception, turnover on downs, interception. The third interception on the goal line, it was basically like a goal line stand play. It was like... So, like, they had a chance to score another touchdown and win the game. Desmond Ritter throws it directly to a Commanders player. I genuinely right. don't... I've watched the play a couple times now. I genuinely don't understand what he was thinking, who he thought was open. It literally feels like his brain had just programmed itself to say, Dude. like, all right, like, my first read is here, drop, drop, throw, without actually looking, going, oh, that guy's not open. Um, uh, Arthur, Arthur, um, Arthur Smith, the coach... Uh, one of the funnier memes of the week, just hands on head, like with his stupid handlebar mustache he insists on growing, just looking truly despondent. And again, it's like, you have too much talent to be like this. You have too much talent to live like this. Please, yeah. please just 
they're the one team I would give the green light. Kirk Cousins, truly, Kirk Cousins' perfect embodiment of mediocre like competency would be enough to get you guys like the division. I'm just so mad that like so many talented guys are being wasted on this. Yeah, it's something. It's uh, there's so. It's, it's like you cut your notes say earlier where the Lions are a good version. Lions, like Lions and Falcons built their teams very similarly, but the Lions figured out what to do, and the Falcons decided to have Desmond Ritter start. Um, let's do the time warp in upstate New York. It's just yeah, I'm gonna keep my Bills rant brief. That was. The minute ESPN was like, oh, Josh Allen's going to break the touchdown record this game, I'm like, oh, we're fucked. That's what they and, call a jinx. Yep. I barely watched the game because we were in the middle of um, a tabletop session. Like, I just had it on my phone in the corner while, like, we inadvertently decided to answer a revolution with a surprisingly amount of competent diplomacy. Um, By me, of all people, but, too. Yes. I, like, you of all people, like, I had to reword certain things because you're like, I'm not 100% sure what that word means. And I'm yeah. like, the fact that this is succeeding is actually really impressive. You are handling this well. Um, you are a crisis manager here. Um, anyway, it's yeah. just like, yeah, and it's just like, yeah, no, it's exactly what I worried about. Brian Dable knew, like, you know, the Giants have some dogs on their defensive line. I think actually grossly underrated uh, compared to his peers, Trayvon Walker and Aiden Hutchinson, um, who I would argue are in much better places to succeed. Um, like they were chasing Allen all around the field. He like, it felt like they knew all of our protections and coverages. And our team is not particularly profound in like separators other than Stefan Diggs. So like, if we don't have time to get open, they're not going to get open. Yeah. And it just underlined for me, like, I don't know, the back and forth on Ken Dorsey is so exhausting. And you can't fire him mid-year because you're just going to bring in someone to run the same offense. But, like, yes, maybe some, like, one, it underlines, like, okay, so if Brian Dable knew all the stuff we were doing, that suggests we're basically just running his offense still. And if you're not bringing anything new to the table and the team has regressed since he left, what exactly do you do here, Ken Dorsey? And... It just also underlines, like, okay, maybe not all of this is fault. Maybe, like, Josh needs to get out of his head a little bit and play more backyard football. Because that was, like, it was the same game. And when I say do the time warp, it's, like, it's the exact same stuff we were dealing with last year after Josh got hurt, where it's, like, the simple things are damn near impossible. We don't have a red zone offense. Like, we have one fully competent receiver. But then we end up winning games because Josh Allen is bigger and stronger than everyone on the football field. And at the end of the day, this is a game run by big and strong men. And he'll just huck a ball against the Detroit Lions, 50 yards, Stephon Diggs will catch it. And then it's like, oh, we're just in field goal range. We win. Okay, good job, everyone. Round up next week. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And it's like, yeah, like maybe it's not all Ken Dorsey's fault, but like if – you know, at some point it's like, well, we're not firing Josh Allen. Yeah. In the order of, like, when you have a superstar on your team, the order in which people are gotten rid of is personnel, coach, play, superstar. You know, we changed up the personnel. We've gotten a new tight end. We've gotten a couple, like, role position receivers. We rebuilt the offensive line. Next is the coach, because uh, it seems like his messages are falling on deaf ears. Um. And yeah, we still won anyway, even though I wanted to jump off a bridge the whole time uh, in Minecraft. Tom said I can get away with saying anything if I qualify it with in Minecraft. Okay, yeah. Um, no. Tom knows what he's talking about. He's tall. Yeah, he's a prof Yeah, he's smart. He has a PhD. Does he have? No, he's, he's getting. A PhD. He's working on it. He's working. Right. On it. He's closer to being a doctor than I am. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's annoying, and it's also very funny that on both to close the first half and the end of the game. Uh, the Giants had a chance to score and they just didn't. Mm -hmm. I love all the people getting mad about the defensive holding. And it's like, are the refs really going to call it more than once? Like, come on, man. Draw a better play then. <laughs> yeah. That's just my personal nitpick. All right. <laughs> the NFC North mess. <laughs> That's what I'm calling anytime Minnesota or Chicago is involved. <laughs> 
Yeah, whole and they fight. played Oofa. and they played each other, which yes. First off, balled out on field goals. There, so there is the first four scores of the game, two for each team, is all field goals. And get ready for these distance stats: fifty-three, twenty-two, fifty-one, fifty-three. Like, Yeesh. these guys are punt like kicking it far. But what a what an atrocious game! I'm gonna drop some stats for you, card. <laughs> um, oh, total total yards by each team: two hundred and twenty for Vikings, two hundred and seventy five for the other guys. Mm-mm. Yuck. Total. For for context, the Detroit Lions who dominated their game 380. Like let's see. Let's go to the Texans. Our baby boys the Texans. 297. And St. uh New Orleans 430 total yards. I'm not talking passing yards. I'm not talking rushing yards. Just total yards. It's the kind of game that is on red zone so little you genuinely forget it was happening yeah. this week. Hell, the Eagles even got more. And that... Like, what? Um, what a well, lackluster also, game. Oh, yeah. Like, the Justin Fields vibes have stalled because he dislocated his finger and tried to pop it back in. Prompting a man who goes by Tyson Bagnant, who I allegedly played well in the preseason, uh, didn't quite show here. Uh, he threw an ugly interception on his first play. Yep. Um, just really, like, people are like, see, look how much co- more competent he is than Justin Fields. He can make downfield throws. And I'm like, shut the hell up. Like, this game, this was not a game to get anything from on no. that front. If Like, let's not... Let's not uh let's not kid ourselves here. When you're playing someone in the same division, I feel like obviously games mean more. Mm-hmm. But when there was nothing, yeah, nothing of value was when here. It's I the, promise you. When it's two teams that started both zero and four, and it was the battle to see who went two and four and who went one and five, you're not looking for much, like. The NFC South all have three wins, um, except for the Panthers, who has zero wins. So that game where they're playing them, because it's a, a win six team, it's like, is this stat even gonna really like? Is this gonna really matter with how bad they've been doing? And then yeah, like, this this truly was a um, draft position game. Yeah, which. It's 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 the battle of you don't know if you want to want them to lose more or, or win more. I'm genu- I'm gonna be honest. I forgot so much about this game. I'm genuinely did it. I was like, when the fuck? When the fuck did that game happen? Like, we talked about like Seattle and Cincinnati being a game of grinders. We talked about uh, Chargers and Cowboys. Unfortunately, we talked about how like. 49ers and Browns went down to field goals uh, winning games and it's like these are all like worth watching football games and then you pull out this right because it's not even like a fun because like I don't know I had an argument with um, my partner's uh, dad once about like he was talking about the um, Patriots last Super Bowl win against the Rams and he's like I love a good defensive battle and I'm like Teams not scoring and just being stalled in the mud isn't a fun defensive game. A fun yeah. defensive game is when there's, like, still scoring, but there's also, like, turnovers and sacks. And, like, you can tell the offense is sweating it out for every single yes. point, but still able to score. Whereas this, it's like, both of these teams just fucking suck. I'm sorry to use uh, language, but, like, there is nothing worse than, like, there's nothing worse than watching a team with a mediocre offensive line and a quarterback who can't run. Because you're just like, oh, everything is going to be excruciating. Yeah. A, a, every first down is going to feel like a miracle. Yeah, no, this wasn't, like, good defensive battles are fantastic to watch. You're If you're watching, like, great stops and people, like, holding the offense back, 
awesome. Love that. <laughs> this wasn't that because there was no. It was there was a defense. There was defensive elements and offensive elements in terms of they both were on the field at some point or another. But that's about <laughs> it. Also, I like kind of going into the lows of this week too. Did you notice that on Sunday every game got progressively worse to watch? Like every mm-hmm. time, if you look at the time slots of the games, those one o'clock games had some pretty killer games. That's where 49ers, Seahawks, uh, hell, even Jaguars and Ravens played. And it's like these these are good football games. And then you go to the four twenty five, like spot you have the eagles having a rough loss you have the patriots and raiders which is kind of another like we're gonna scrap it out and fight for like fight for the next good draft pick and then you have cardinals and rams in blowouts like yeah i guess my brain is programmed because the bills used to always play at one o'clock if they or like I never kept the four o'clock games. I would like that would be like all right. Carter's gonna start prepping his end of the day stuff. Um, yeah. So like yeah, it's not abnormal for me, but yeah, like you're not wrong. Um, it it got real stinky real fast. And like I guess I guess you can argue you can argue that my dislike of the Eagles game was because I'm an Eagles fan. However. That's still only one game out of four at that time slot that could be considered close and competitive teams. Mm-hmm. And the stats still don't lie for the other three. It's just like what do like I'm all for I'm all for flex games, especially if it's just time slots on the same day. Like, we bump yeah. a 1 o'clock game to a 4 o'clock game. That just means you tailgate longer. Nothing changes. You're not disrupting your day any differently. Um, right. And I don't see why... Like, I get why so, the networks are often against, like, like flexing because it adds chaos. But, like, I don't see why the networks wouldn't be like, no, I want two good games. I don't want just one good game. Yeah, I want... Like, I don't want to, like, have a good 1 o'clock game and a real stinker 4 o'clock game. And like, I get like I get like, football's like, I think the most po- like popular like, if you're gonna ask what time just in general what time a football game starts, to like a crowd of people, the majority of them are gonna say one p.m. on Sunday. Like, mm-hmm. That's when football starts, and it's just like, so like that's obviously gonna be like a very powerful like, a very full demographic. But then, like, when you get to, like, the 4 o'clock games, because that's more, that's the networks fighting it out slot. Not oh, yeah. based off of what they were dealt. Because you, you got Monday Night Football and Sunday Night Football. Sunday Night's always going to be on NBC. Monday Night's always going to be on ABC. Like, that's those are locks. Thursday Night Football's always on Twitch slash Amazon Prime, but saying it's on Twitch is funnier. And then you have, you have the huge crowd at uh one where it's like you're not really fighting other networks for views you're just going to be like all right let's get everyone showing properly but then mm-hmm. you got three to four games at four o'clock uh, so that's a good portion at least a third of the league remaining and you have that's when you actually have like legitimate competition for on a network level for viewership. And I feel like you're going to want to have your best game at that. Like if you, if you're not having the Sunday, Sunday night football or Monday night football game, that's when you want to have your best game. Right. Right. And this week did not show that. Absolutely not. Um, Some notes for the week. Unfortunately, Anthony Richardson will be taking the rest of the year off for his uh, shoulder sprain. Uh, It is season-ending surgery. Honestly, it's both good and bad. 
Because it's clear they learned their lesson from Andrew Luck, and they're yes. not going to grind someone into the dirt again. No, they're but on the other throw hand, throw Minshew in there, and he is going to uh, lick his wounds in his van and somehow survive off of, I'm assuming, Red Bull and like vegetables he found on the side of a road. Yes, and they will build a better team as a result of it. Um, and But it also sucks because, unlike Andrew Luck, the one thing like Anthony Richardson really needs is reps. Again, he looks, he, he has looks the good. upside. Yeah. He has incredible moments, but it's like the moment-to-moment -moment is where he just needs to have experience at NFL speed. Yeah, he needs the experience, but I also feel like, I feel like the now is a very good year to do that so give me one second to just so they are three and three in their division with jaguars texans and titans and they're technically in the number two spot like ranking wise mm -hmm. i feel like that's like a very solid start to a season he's gotten both wins and losses he still definitely needs more game time but stopping to get a surgery that's going to be important and they can they can play out the rest of the season and just see how things go like uh who is it Zach Moss that kid's showing up to play pretty well um Pittman doing good Jonathan Taylor's actually back now I feel like that they're not they're not in a super screwed up spot Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, yeah, like, it's a weirdly stable position for them to be in considering how yeah. chaotic it just was. And I think that him taking the surgery is going to absolutely ruin their chances of playoffs, but I don't think it's going, I think it's smarter for them in the long run to take, take the L this season and be able to get him 100% for next season, as well as get some good draft picks to help round out the team to give a huge threat next year. Right. Yeah, honestly, that's probably where I end up leaning with the reps thing. Um, my other note is CJ Stroud's first interception was good. <laughs> um, okay, so this was just a funny note from this week. So, yes, Anthony Richardson's record of uh, compl attempts, completions to start a career while throwing an interception has finally come to an end. He threw yes. an interception against the New Orleans Saints. It's funny that we had our cast pot bowl uh, this week. Yes. Um, and it was just kind I of an okay football game. Yeah, it w I wouldn't say it was a bad game. but Oh, no, just kind of an unremarkable football game. Yeah, it was... It wasn't... It wasn't good enough to be mentioned in the highs. It wasn't bad enough to be mentioned in the lows. Um, but yes, I just wanted to bring up this one specific thing. So so on their second drive, CJ Stroud passed short right intended for Dalton Schultz, intercepted by Z Braun at New Orleans 45. Uh, he makes it 10 yards, fumbles it, and then recovers it uh, at the Houston 41. So even his interception benefited the team and yeah. got them a free first down. And then he immediately goes and throws a touchdown on that half drive that they got. Again, even when he screws up, he's cool. Yeah. Look at our baby boy go. Maybe we'll yeah. just make our a new segment for the baby boys check-in. And we just check on all... Well, we can't check on Richardson anymore, but we'll check on like CJ Stroud, Jordan... All Lowe. of our like darling players? Yes. We'll just add a few every, like, couple of weeks or, like, every year. Yeah. We'll... And they'll just be a part of the squad. I like that. Yeah, we'll do, like, we'll do the rookie, we'll do a new rookie class every year, and we'll keep one or two from the previous rookie class. I like it. Um, all right, Carter, what is the question of the week? The question of the week is... Hmm. I would say the question of the week is if you could do one thing to the NFL schedule, what would it be? Hmm. 
because I've heard a lot of interesting ideas this these past few weeks. And that kind of made me wonder, like, if we just had the power to change how scheduling is done, what would we do? I think, I think that teams, this might sound like a weird one, but I feel like it's better. I think that teams that you're playing against shouldn't be released until the off season. Oh, interesting. I like, like my opinions on, um, like bye weeks and what time slot your game is have been very well made already. But I feel like if I had to change one thing to scheduling, I think that would be my pick. Oh, wait, uh, yeah, that would be my main pick. My follow-up would be, I think you should face your division rival week one and week 18. I like that. They've nominally made week 18 supposed to be some kind of significant game. It's a, but it's, yeah, it's I think it should be division week. rivals. Yeah. yeah. Week 18's grudge match week, which I thoroughly enjoy. But I feel like division rivalry for every for the first game of the season and last game of the season to see how things go would be fantastic yes i like that yeah it's interesting because like there are parts of the schedule that are locked in down in terms of like what division the other conference and this conference you're playing i think it would be more interesting to randomize it more like have like w- have like two options for like divisions you play and then randomize it I don't know. I would like yeah. to see it get mixed up a little bit. So, like, and I guess, I don't know, like, because strength of schedule is kind of arbitrary anyway, just lean in the of it. Um, yeah. My personal one, and this is, like, one I've heard, I really like the idea, that much like Week 18, they don't announce the order oh. until the Monday, after Monday Night Football. Like, yeah. the order of the games. Like, who's at one, who's at four, who's the night game. Obviously, yeah. the Thursday night games have to be set in stone. That's, like, an actual health and safety thing. Yeah. And the Monday night games can be set in stone. But, like, every other game, I think, should, like, the network should just have a pool for which ones they're allowed to get and what times they're allowed to get them. I mean, my big one, which is obviously never going to happen, is I think they should cut the season by four games. I'm going to be honest. That's kind of a hot take I've had over every sport. Yes, you've had weirdly it started. Too. Yes, weirdly it started as a baseball take because people were clowning on this idea of like, because like the only statistical comparison, you know, Shohei Otani, right? Yes. The only relevant statistical comparison for him is Babe Ruth, and people are just clowning on that because it's like Babe Ruth was a chain smoker who ate hot dogs in between innings and who played at a time in the sport where the slider wasn't invented. Yeah. And like maybe three guys could throw the ball 90 miles per hour. And I'm like, yeah, but isn't that, doesn't that feel like the pace baseball was supposed to be played at? You watch the like same the fact video that, showed... that I watched where they were talking about that? Probably. But it's like, yeah, there's a reason why there's so many more pitching injuries these days, because it's like the human body, you can push the human body to more and more things, but it's still the same frail body. Like, you're still going to break down. It's the same problem with, like, NBA Center. Like, that's why people are freaking out about Wembyama, because it's like uh, human beings are not supposed to be seven foot, and they're especially no. not supposed to be, like, seven six with, like, weird, like, chicken legs. Yeah, um, no, you got to have a body that never stops growing, and you can... Uh, drink 128 beers in one sitting and pass out in the lobby of a hotel and they can't move you so they just leave you there like Andre the Giant man if which I is was inexplicably the tall, least crazy I would live my life like that oh yeah okay. um but Andre yeah it's no, going to get his own episode of me just telling Andre the Giant stories hell honestly hell yeah um but like yeah and no it's cuz we've had so many injuries this season already and someone, add, like, I was listening to the um, Ringer Fantasy podcast, and they're just like, why don't you just have people like Christian McCaffrey on a pitch count? Like, don't you just want to save him for the playoffs? And I'm like, this would all be solved if we just made the season shorter. But unfortunately, like, all of the owners have this, like, terminal CEO brain where it's like, yeah. more means more money. When it's reality, it's like, the product will be better if it's scarcer. Also, but I digress. I don't, I wouldn't hate the fact of dropping two division games but i think it would be fun like in down to one every season however i would think it would be fun that it is a either the winner of the last year's game is the home team Mm -hmm. and you play 
like you play your division rival twice, like I said, week one and week eighteen, and for the other team you play twice, it is randomized. Like you get a coin flip for which the other two teams it is. And oh, I kind of like that. Just like really like, and they, they tell you late. Like, you're not playing your division rival, so it's going to be, like, Eagle. it's going to be Eagles, and it's going to be, like, Cowboys, for example. They're both guaranteed to play at home, and then it's just a coin flip to see who they play for a second time. And you find out, like, a week ahead of time. I dig it. A real surprise factor. All right, let's get into next week. Um... Yes, as you mentioned, the Kelly Greens Kelly are going Greens. to make their grand debut, I believe, right? I'm, yep, it's going to be their the first game they play. They're wearing them twice this season versus Miami this week and then versus the Bills, actually, uh, huh. a couple weeks from now. And I'm so excited because there's only one player that's still in the Eagles that was in the last Kelly Green game, and that's Fletcher Cox. And I did you, not know that. Yeah, you get, like, you have the quote – unquote core four of Fletcher Cox, BG, Lane Johnson, and Jason Kelsey, who this is their, I think, a total of 10th season all playing together, which is insane, first of all. And only one of them's been in, in like an actual Kelly Green game. I feel like this is going to be insane for them. Because these are essential players for each team, for the team that everyone loves and they they're getting like their most hype like nostalgia plus just cult following for the Kelly Green jerseys. So I'm really excited for them to all just get to play and like also your more longer term essentials like Darius Slay, Jake Elliott also getting opportunities to play in Kelly Greens and like and it's not just like oh, we're going to sell the jersey and you guys can wear it on your own time and stuff. It's like, no, you're you're going out onto the field at the link wearing this jersey. I, I feel like, like that's it. insane. I feel like that's, like, I feel like last week's loss, especially against the Jets, is going, I would hope it puts a fire under their asses. And I feel like the specialness of this game is, like, Technically, I shouldn't advocate for steroids, but they're all just shooting up rabies in the back, getting ready <laughs> to go Good absolutely boy. nuts. Yeah, I honestly, I've gotten it. I've bought it. And I, I, was, I also got a Kelly Green jersey. I got a Jordan Davis, one of my... If we did this a year earlier, Jordan Davis would have been one of our sweet baby boys. You know what? You're right. I can't believe he fell that far. Like, yeah, I know, I know. Oh, well, he doesn't, you know, he's not a pass rusher. He doesn't play on third down. It's like, yeah, but he makes the uh, he makes third down easier because he's dominant in the other two downs. And now he is a good pass rusher. He's a like, good pass rusher. He did it anyway. Now. And, like, he he's one of those people that he doesn't get the best stats every game or, like the like, the same level of recognition as some of the other players. But if you look at him every single play – they're putting up two offensive linemen on him, and he's still powering through. The dude's a beast, and I love him. Oh, yeah. Um, we also have a surprising amount of buys this week. Yes. So Car Carolina, who just need a week, they just – it would behoove them to not play football for a little bit. Cincinnati riding the high of back-to-back -back wins, giving um, Burrow more time to rest. Uh you know, after the disastrous start, it couldn't have worked out better. Um, Dallas, uh, you know, just yeah. I feel like another week to not think of things to do. I feel like this is a, not a super beneficial week to Dallas. Like mm -hmm. they're not Agreed. struggling. They don't need to and like to like in order to regroup. And they're not they're not like Cincinnati where they're pulling like a huge comeback. So let's like take a second. They're just kind of there. I feel like right. it's, I feel like it's just a short end of the stick for them. Oh yeah, I agree with that. 
Um, we also have Houston. Our uh, summer children are getting their, uh, fall, you know, they're going orchard. They're going out to the orchard to pick apples and yep. make cider. So good for them. Uh, the New York Jets. Um, basically, if they're going to jump off the Zach Wilson bandwagon, this feels like the last chance to do it before it's like, okay, now you're really locked into this. And Tennessee coming off of uh, another, another loss. embarrassing loss. Um, yeah, I think this is a good week for most of them. Uh, mm-hmm. This is the week with the most um, buys. Um, I also feel like it's very interesting dynamics based off of the teams. Like Houston and the Jets are both three and three, but I feel like it's two very different dynamics for their off mm-hmm. their seasons based off of their histories and stuff and who they have. Like right, Houston, right. a nice like a semi early bye week. They're three and three. They can really just kind of take a second, get their lot like catch up with what is happening and the rush that is happening and then the jets can try and get their shit together and um they they still won last week i won't deny that but they can still at least try and get their shit together with like injuries and just removing all the grass from or all the turf from metlife and replacing it with good old-fashioned american grass Um, yeah it really is it's depressing how shameless it is that it's like oh because it's just easy concerts on later yeah if we have turf um for our don't bother games of the week your first is san fran minnesota yes um it's as as much as i'm not the biggest fan of san fran it is still a good team and (laughs) the minute and minnesota vikings haven't shown much this season especially with justin jefferson now out it is I think the the biggest contributing factor for me making it the don't bother game is it also has that primo time slot of Monday night football. Mm, right, right. That's that's another huge factor for me is like the don't like I said the don't sleep on games shouldn't be Monday night or Sunday night football because they're not getting slept on they're getting fully acknowledged. But or at least when we're predicting what they are for next week. And you're going to put that possible one-sided mess on Monday Night Football? Again, I just... I get why you don't flex as many primetime games. Good lord. Yeah, like, I can I'll, I can guarantee I will watch a minimal amount of that game. Enough to talk about it today. Or next episode. And that's about it. <laughs> and yours is um, Falcons Buccaneers. That's I'm so, a I very just don't interesting like the NFL. one. Yeah, it's interesting because it could decide that I just I can't I just hate watching the NFC South. It is truly a game of mediocrity. <laughs> like the last like five years of the NFC South have felt like a thousand. I'm pretty sure one year a team with a losing record got to go to the playoffs, and I'm just like very much against that. I think that was last year. <laughs> I think that was. Oh God in heaven, it might have been. Yeah, I just I have no tolerance for the NFC South anymore, and like, if I did, I'm pretty sure I don't have anyone fantasy wise in this game, so why bother? Mm-hmm. Alrighty, now let's get to the don't sleep on games. Pittsburgh okay. Rams. Yep. I feel like I was thinking about Lions Ravens between this and Lions Ravens, mm. but Lions Ravens they've got That's too mainstream. They've got enough hype this season both teams that it would make it too mainstream to watch. Or not Agreed. not to watch, but to like like that's going to be one of those games that if you're not a fan of a lot of these other games like Falcons, Buccaneers, Browns, Colts, Raiders, Bears. A lot of those people are going to be turning into Lions, Ravens if they want to watch some more <laughs> legitimate football. Um, right, right. Ooh, wow, that is a very rough lineup for the one o'clock slots. Maybe we'll have an inverse of what happened last time. Um, oh boy. This, but Steelers, Rams. I feel like has the potential to be the most interesting. They're both. Well, Pittsburgh's three and two. 
Rams are three and three. Neither team is considered their best in their division, but they've had some surprising wins. So like, I feel like it's going to be an, a good one to just watch out and just kind of like, I feel like it fits the mold of the don't sleep on it. I like it. Um, meanwhile, mine is Cardinal Seahawks because well, very interesting you know, choice in my opinion. Yes, because the Seahawks continue to be sort of a pleasant surprise of a team since last year, uh, still fighting for a playoff spot. The Cardinals have been a pleasant surprise as a team as well in a different direction, though they're still losing football games. And I just think it's an interesting game for the Cardinals because this is kind of the do or die moment, I think, for a lot of the direction the season's going to go. Because Kyler Murray is coming off of the IR. Oh yeah, I didn't. We didn't put that in the notes. Um, Kyler Murray's coming back. I feel like that's huge. Yes. And the question is, it's like, do you play him or do you keep Dobbs? In? Like, you kind of have to play him because you've given him so much money, and he is like nominally the face of the franchise. Like, you know, I again, it's like we can talk tanking all day, but it's really hard to sell actually tanking to the players. So, like, yeah, if Dobbs Dobbs does a good job, does he get to stay as the starter, or is it more of like a, is it more of like a you are auditioning for your next gig sort of thing? I think a lot of different people's careers will be dictated by this game for the Cardinals. Yes. All right. And with that, we wrap up another week. We're getting ready for week seven. Um, tonight's game is going to be St. Or not. Why do I keep calling New Orleans St. Louis? They're very different thoughts. Uh, Jaguars versus Saints. So that's going to be that has potential to be very interesting. I uh, yeah, that'll be a fun one. Um, check out Caspod D and D and the resurgence of Caspod conspiracy. Woo woo. Thank you all for listening so much as we reach the midpoint of the season. We are so happy to have you all here, and we hope you enjoy another week of football. Yeah.